Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. In the last lecture, we went over this idea of an extended evolutionary synthesis. And I was rather harsh with it. I identified four problems with this sort of approach. I said it's no extension. There's nothing to be extended. And there is actually nothing new um, in the content of this extension. It's no synthesis. It doesn't even try. It's just a bunch of different research fields that get lumped into some sort of snail looking spirally diagram. It misses the point. I am missing a more philosophically grounded discussion of the nature of the organism, the organization of the organism, open-ended evolution, the adjacent possible, that sort of stuff. And there is no theory. If you look at it, it's a bunch of different fields of investigation. And the idea to synthesize those doesn't have any theoretical content. It doesn't do any theoretical work. It doesn't, you know, lead to new questions. It doesn't provide new answers. And so I was saying that this sort of vacuous pseudo-theoretical debate, like the one generated by this uh, discussion about synthesis, you know, it's, it's completely outdated. Logical positivism is dead. I called it a, a, a scientific, a, a philosophical zombie, okay? It's not the right thing. We don't need another synthesis. And I was sort of raising this idea that it may be a smokescreen to cover a profound lack uh, in our ability to deal with the complexities of evolution. And you may say, okay, you know, now he's gone overboard. This is crazy. This is not true. There's also Hanlon's razor that we should uh, consider. Whatever you can attribute to incompetence, uh, you should not attribute to malice. So is there intent here? What's happening? So I think we need to discuss a few of the social and political factors that lead to this situation. The problem is that what I'm you know, proposing in this lecture and the whole course is a sort of a, a real rethink of what we're doing, not just in evolutionary biology, but in science, right? I mean, we need to go beyond the Newtonian paradigm. We're, we're supposed to ask some really deep questions. So, so how is that gonna happen? And is that helped or hindered by uh, these sort of uh, discussions like the, the extended synthesis. I mean, in principle, these people, this is a community that's pushing in the same direction, right? Sometimes it even hints that sort of, you know, uh, dialectic, you know, uh, dynamics and all that kind of stuff. Shouldn't, you know, this be a way to get there? And I, I, I think not. So what I want to do in this lecture is I want to take a, a brief excursion and think a little bit about um, this sort of idea of bullshit, okay? So, this is not an insult. This is a philosophical concept. It was uh, analyzed um, by Harry Frankfurt in his best-selling book uh, from 2015 called On Bullshit. And so, what uh, Frankfurt is raising in this book is that bullshit is a very common and increasingly common phenomenon in our society and unfortunately also in science. There is such a, th a thing as scientific bullshit. Frankfurt defines it philosophically as, uh, he says it's speech, I would broaden it to communication that's intended to persuade without regard for the truth. So you can think of it as having some sort of hidden agenda. It's misrepresenting its own intention and it's sort of careless about the really big questions. There's some debate in the philosophical literature if you need to have sort of intent behind that or not. I am sort of on the liberal side of that and I think, you know, bullshit doesn't necessarily have to be intentional. Maybe the people who actually perpetrate it are not intentional bullshitters, but bullshit occurs nonetheless. Let's, let's analyze this idea uh, a little bit further, okay? So uh, a follow-up paper a direct answer to Frankfurt's little book um, written by Cohen um, called Deeper into Bullshit said basically what I just said, you know, the sort of the intent of the bullshitter shouldn't go into bullshit. Bullshit should be seen as the product of bullshitting 
okay? And, and bullshit statements, they consist, they, they suffer from unclarifiable unclarity. This is Cohen's concept, it's great. So it is this course, according to Cohen, that is not only obscure, but which cannot be rendered unobscure. It's obscure by design again, or maybe just by nature. So the sort of vague pictorial, you know, verbally formulated model is very prone to that. So the models that come out of um, uh, Evo Devo and also the extended synthesis that are phrased in this way, they are liable, they are prone to become a little bullshitty, at least in this sense, okay? There is really nothing there. There is no substance behind it. It's not clarifiable into a working sort of structure or concept, okay? So that's, that's one problem. If we uh, classify types of bullshit um, a bit further, the one that is most common in science, scientific bullshit, is uh, what uh, Pennycook at, and co-authors called uh, pseudo-profound bullshit, okay? That type of bullshit consists of seemingly impressive assertions that are presented as true and meaningful, but are actually vacuous. They are meaningless, okay? Um, and there are different degrees of this, of course. The authors use Deepak Chopra as sort of quantum healing stuff and you know that is very sort of deep pseudo profound bullshit so we're talking about a, a you know relatively shallow moderate level of bullshit here but bullshit not, nonetheless i think and so um another very sort of uh, interesting uh, classification of bullshit is provided by uh, bergstrom and, and 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 west there's this is an up uh, forthcoming book called calling bullshit, it's, it looks at bullshit in data. And if you visit their website, they have an extremely good uh, lecture on bullshit as well that I highly recommend. And they say, well, the old style, old school bullshit was sort of fancy words that were meaningless, you know. But nowadays we are much better at bullshitting than we were before, it's sort of quantitative bullshit. We have numbers. Uh, it's not only fancy words, but bullshit is wrapped in, in misrepresented facts, numbers, arguments, algorithms. Um, and meaningless figures, okay? So this sort of thing, I think, qualifies as newfangled pseudo-profound bullshit. Just the diagram, okay? Because one important distinction that both Cohen and also uh, Bergstrom and, and, and West make is that calling bullshit doesn't go after the bullshitter. Okay, I'm not calling out people here. And I said, this may or may not be intentional. I don't know. What I'm calling out here is this, this sort of diagram, this presentation of a theory, the product that is presented here is bullshit. Okay, and so, you know, why am I presenting this in my lecture if I don't like it? What is the point? Again, we have to ask this question. And the point is that I think it is a problem if we really want this sort of science that uh, James Grissomer would advocate, a multi-perspectival, you know, Winsatian Grissomer type science. Okay, this is in the way of that. So what we want to do by formulating a coherent sort of philosophically grounded account like I'm trying to do in this course is we want in the end to carve reality by its joints, okay? And so our, our perspectives on reality need to sort of fit that reality, okay? So this idea of carving reality by its joints goes back to Plato. Um, and uh, so he, he said, ideally our best theories will be those which carve nature at its joints. And so the, the, the problem with the extended synthesis, of course, is that it doesn't sort of, it doesn't work that way at all. It doesn't even map onto the existing set of disciplines, concepts in, in evolutionary biology very well, okay? It's just an assortment of different questions. And those fields are separate for a reason. That's why it's meaningless to do a synthesis because they carve reality by its joints. They are looking at different problems and are using uh, sort of, 
you know, practical perspectives. You can call them uh, program agendas. Philosopher Alan Love and also Ingo Brigand have written about this. So these are sort of complexes of, of, of you know, practices, but also models, concepts, tools um, that fit together to address a certain question. Okay, so they're fine on their own again. Okay, so there is something that doesn't register here. It doesn't correspond to anything. And so we have this sort of really well worked out and wonderful ontology that Wimsat provides. And it, he's telling us we're, we're, we're you know, we, we're living here as biologists and of course as social scientists as well in a very difficult area. Not like this, most of physics happens in, in that sort of easy part of the universe where it's easy to theorize, where you can make very broad generalizations. So we're living in this bio psychological thicket here. It's very complicated to figure it out. Okay, so we need the right approach here and we need a different approach from physics. We don't need grand unified theories, okay? We need perspectives because, you know, the levels aren't clean in this area of uh, the causal structure doesn't show any clearly separated levels. And so we need to work in this sort of uh, perspectival uh, problem or question oriented way. So I've been trying to give you a philosophical grounding for the sort of approach that I envisage here. And this grounding is totally missing from stuff like the extended synthesis. And what's worse is the discussion about extended synthesis is preventing us from thinking about these more, uh, these deeper, more important problems. That's, that's my argument here. It is a problem, okay? It's actually obfuscating things. So let's just remind ourselves again what perspectives are from, from Wimsat's uh, book here and, uh, or his 1994 article that is also chapter 10 in his re-engineering philosophy book from 2007. He says, a perspective is an intriguingly quasi-subjective, or at least observer technique or technology relative, cut on the phenomena characteristic of a system, which needn't be bound to given levels. This is wonderful. It's all we need. Okay, we have a specific problem, we go about it in the way that is adequate for this problem. And as I said before, this sort of very theoretical notion has been, uh, you know, is reverberating in this very sort of more practical notion of a, of a, of a program agenda, a problem agenda, sorry. So each system, especially when the systems are complex, like biological systems can be characterized by multiple multiple perspectives, and we need multiple perspectives to understand it, just like Aristotle wanted us to take all the different explanations and they together provide an understanding of the phenomenon. Perspectives cannot be ordered hierarchically. They, they don't just fit together like in a, in a set of Tupperware boxes, a Russian doll or something like that, and often do not add up to a complete picture of the system. Remember that statue of Hume, it's, you never get the whole picture. You only get your perspective. Whether or not you have the right perspective will depend crucially on what your question and problem is. And the problems and questions are incredibly diverse. And because of the nature, open-ended nature of evolution, constantly changing. So Grismer, Wimsat's um, former student, says, we need trans-perspective cooperation here. We need to compare perspectives. We need to step out and recognize the limits. And uh, he advocates this sort of robustness analysis, comparative approach between perspectives that we've been through last module. And it's logical that open as uh, evolution is a radically emergent pro process that constantly generates novelty by rewriting its own rules, requires such an open-ended and open-minded perspectival approach. Synthesis is anathema to this. Synthesis, the idea of synthesizing anything, is not grounded in any currently acceptable philosophical position about doing research in biology and in evolution in particular. Logical positivism is dead. And I was arguing that this is not even the point. This theory isn't a theory at all, remember. It is a political tool, okay? And now the argument in this lecture is that this political tool is hindering rather than promoting progress in the right direction in evolutionary biology, okay? This is my opinion, it may be controversial. But let me explain 
a little more. So we've got these really, really, really big tasks here. We're in this thicket. We have really big problems. We have really hard problems to solve. This is the right time. We have tools to solve them now. So it would be great if science could tackle these really big problems. Like how can we move with a formalism beyond Newton's paradigm and, and, and learn how to explain these radically open emergent um, sort of processes. Deep ideas, you know, Grissomer's different perspectives, his, his account of the, the reproducer that embeds the replicator. Amazing, okay? Where are they? Are they in this extended synthesis? They're not there, okay? They don't exist, in fact. Okay, compare this with, with this sort of shallow, sort of in the limelight, right in your face, exchange in a tabloid scientific journal. Whose idea was it to hand our fates over to journals like Nature or Science to decide over our careers? They are not serious. They're run by journalistic principles. They need to sell copy, okay? So basically, they want a spectacular exchange of ideas about nothing that goes nowhere and doesn't have any theoretical content, in fact, okay? But it's a good spectacle. This is what's happening here. And this is really bad because it makes it really difficult to have a serious con conversation about the real problems. And it makes it really difficult for good theoreticians who do good work, profound work, to be heard and to survive at all because we have a system in science and this sort of dependence on tabloid bullshit journals is a part of the problem. We have a system that fosters opportunists and people who are sort of self, good self-presenters. Self-promotion has become increasingly important. And this, these are the sort of conditions that foster the appearance of bullshit. And it's, like, it's crazy, you know, we need science more than ever. I mean, society is flooded by bullshit, so you, sh you would hope that science at least stays away from it. But it doesn't. Okay, so this is the beginning of Frankfurt's book. It's one of the best beginnings of a book ever. Okay, he writes, the first sentence of the book, one of the most salient features of our culture is that there is so much bullshit. It's increasing every day as well. It's a real problem. This is, again, not an insult. The word is a bit insulting, but it's a real problem, a serious problem, and it is a philosophical problem. Okay, everyone knows this. Each of us contributes his share, or her share, of course, but we tend to take the situation for granted. So this is, in the very first lecture, I said, we have a bullshit system we live in, okay? We have oversimplified explanations for really complex uh, realities out there. And they are not adequate anymore. But because we cannot even think of alternatives, because we're caught in this illusion that what we know about the world works and we can control it, because of that, we are running into all these problems that we have. And I do think that stuff like the extended synthesis that gives us the illusion of depth, the illusion of, you know, we're in control, there is progress in this field, they are contributing to this uh, state of um, what Adam Curtis calls hyper-normality, a normality that isn't real, okay? And we've trapped us, ourselves a little bit in, the, in this, in um, evolutionary biology, in the biology of the organism. We need to get out of this trap, and that requires a philosophical rethinking, but a true rethinking, not a pseudo-rethinking of what we're doing. So, the problem is, it's overwhelming, okay? Shallow theory is popular. Here, a little uh, screenshot from Google Scholar about how many citations. This is on top there, is the introduction to the Piliucci Miller book, the book itself, uh, you know, and then the three uh, papers that follow are highly cited papers on the um, evolutionary synthesis. The book contains a bunch of book chapters that make true contributions and interesting contributions or review interesting topics that I found very helpful when I read it. The rest is absolutely free of any theoretical content. Look at the citations, these, who cites them for what? Okay, it's sort of, okay, I don't know. 
it's 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 all about self presentation it's all about you you know you know tribal you know, community building it's us versus them and you don't get around it it's everywhere in certain fields so you need to cite this stuff although what for there's nothing in it that you could cite it for right and you know here's james grismer um you know that not great 51 citations why are these people not heard okay okay it's published in a, in a book that's out of print so that's a problem but this example is pretty representative of the really deep stuff you know Kaufman stuff it doesn't get a lot of you know Maya Monteville he doesn't get a lot of citations it's drowned out by this sort of shallowness okay and that shallowness gives us the impression the illusion that you know we're doing theoretical work here and there's theoretical conceptual progress there's a great um sort of opinion piece that appeared in pns in 2016 by uh, uh donald and Stuart uh jeman jeman i don't quite know how to pronounce their last names and they sort of looked at science in the 20th century and they realized that most of the conceptual breakthroughs happened in the first half of that century very few in the latter half, we replaced it by progress through technological advances, mainly in their analysis, and also uh, by a massive amount of self-promotion that is hindering true conceptual advances, because it's heaping on the marketing bullshit, self-promoting bullshit, onto science, scientific debates. We need to cut out of that loop again to have truly profound um change and we need this change to make progress in biology but also we need this change in thinking urgently as a species i think okay so what is happening why why is this happening what's happened you know how has it come to this and and the problem i think just very briefly i give a whole series of lectures on this topic about academia today you know it's it's, it's moved away very very far from this idea of this protected hall where the philosophers are discussing okay they're talking to each other there's all kinds of very different people here so here are uh, parmenides and and heraclitus okay they they don't agree on anything plato and aristotle okay but they talk and they're interested in the other's idea ideas they're also protected okay they have time and space look at the space it's open to the sky but at the same time it's walled in and they're protected from the outside world to focus on these really deep problems this is what academia was for originally that's the ideal of academia instead what we have now is we've sort of you know turned everything around and we run academia like we run everything else by free market principles okay so we've developed a, a sort of massive cult of productivity. It's, it's short-sighted thinking. You need to produce every year to get a new grant. You have to stay in, in line. You, you work in your field. You have to be productive. If you change fields, you know, that is something you have to do if you want to tackle these questions. These really big questions in our field right now, they involve, you know, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biochemistry. Um, biology you know all kinds of disciplines and it's very important that we can sort of do in interdisciplinary work but that requires time uh, and is more risky than just staying in your field and producing stuff or also maybe this is the reason why we produce so much stuff that doesn't say anything okay all these papers that come out on the extended evolutionary synthesis most of them you know say exactly the same thing over and over again and i know a lot of other cases where this is happening don't get me wrong i mean this is a phenomenon that doesn't just happen in our field i mean the whole uh, field of uh, evolutionary psychology is very prone to bullshit okay it's very i mean obviously because there's very it's it's based on very shaky philosophical foundations and it's of course its insights are, are very deep human interest also public interest and so this is perfect condition perfect storm okay so what we're doing here is we have to we have to look busy all the time okay so let's say you've published a paper in the early 90s 
about innovation maybe with an esteemed colleague. And then, you know, you haven't done anything for the, the next 15 years, which is a bit ironic if you think, because you're studying innovation, but you've published sort of reviews of the same ideas again and again and again. So you need to do something new to be seen, right? You need to produce something. So you come up with something you call the extended evolutionary synthesis. And suddenly look at the citation numbers, you're there again, but you haven't produced any innovation since 1991. Okay, and so this is happening all over the place. We are seen doing stuff, but we're not really doing things. And I think this is a real problem. And, and it's sort of, it's, it's because, you know, we have this, this sort of uh, obsession with, with efficiency. We're studying evolution. It happens over millions and millions of years. We don't have to efficiently churn out um, um, stuff. We have to be profound, not productive. Um, it's based on competition, and this is what Wimsat and Grismer want to get us out of. No, we have to cooperate in basic science in general, and in a complex um, field like evolutionary biology, there are so many valid, good perspectives that you know we have to cooperate, not uh, compete. It's about predictability, and you know this whole philosophical theory that I was presenting shows you that the world is not predictable. If you can predict what you're going to discover the next five years in your grant, then you failed, okay? Just like evolution, you want to produce something new. Science, I, I told you when we talked about the process of doing science, is something that is very similar to evolution. It's open and you cannot predict what it's gonna produce, okay? Because the rules are changing as it goes along. It's a radically emergent process itself. So this sort of, you know, accountability, that we've still developed an accountant's way of planning science year by year you you know milestones and you know you know you, you have to sort of write these gantt charts and tell the funders what exactly you're going to do this is completely crazy okay and it is hindering the sort of uh perspectival philosophical fundamental approach uh that i'm advocating here productivity this is at the center of it all Okay, so we measure ourselves by the number of citations, the age factors, and of course, and uh, this is very important, as soon as this becomes the target, we have lost our way, all right? So what's happening here, this is an article uh, in the online magazine Eon, and I recommend uh, also the book by uh, uh, historian Jerry Muller, who uh, wrote the book called The Tyranny of Metrics, and, and he talks about something which is called Goodhart's Law, and that's when a metric um, becomes the target, um, the system is screwed. And his example, of course, is the American education system. That's one of the big examples he's using, where the, the, the statistical tests, in, instead of actually um, assessing the quality of the education, has become the target. Each school needs to produce children that are good at tests. So it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we are, and there is quantitative ev evidence for this, we are maximizing our age factors in science nowadays. And the people who initially published the extended evolutionary synthesis are a, a perfect example of this type of exercise that isn't advancing science, but is advancing their career. And this is the essence of bullshit. Okay, so the problem is, and we have to realize that the value of originality and wisdom, it cannot be measured. What's original? It, it is not clear. It is radically context dependent. What is wisdom? Well, we don't know really, but it's wisdom we need. It's, it's profound thinking about what we're doing here. We need to change things instead of throwing around infographics and buzzwords. Okay, so that's distracting from the actual issues at hand here. I just want to throw this inspirational quote by Nicholas Rescher at you once again. The future of science is an enigma. Innovation is the very name of the game. Not only do these theses and themes of science change, but so do the very questions. We need to break out of our own Newtonian paradigm, our own Newtonian way of seeing science. And finally, start exploring again. We need to make it possible to explore again. In the very last lecture, I'll come back to that topic a little bit about the social and political circumstances we need for the sort of science 
I envisage, but it's a really hard problem. So coming back to the problem of bullshit, one reason it's so hard to fight and one reason it's so prevalent is uh, summarized in Alberto Brandolini's um, bullshit asymmetry principle, which states that the amount of energy necessary to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. This is a huge problem, social media, fake news, everything, but it is also a problem in science where bullshit really shouldn't spread. So what we need in the end is a real change in the system. I can't go into the details of this. I have lots of ideas and a project on this, but this is not the topic of this lecture. But basically, we have to take these ideas. It's interesting. We have to take these ideas that I've presented about evolution series and apply them to the scientific system. So we need to get away from the idea that we can control the scientific process. We need to be a part of it, in it. We don't have to maximize output, but maximize reprodu reproducibility. It shouldn't be competitive and close, but open and collaborative. This is what Grissomer is, is suggesting. In, it shouldn't be an intellectual monoculture. We don't need unification. We need diversified perspectives. I can just repeat this over and over again. And it should allow risk-taking again and shouldn't be risk-averse that we just stay within the sort of dogmas and our little scientific tribe where we're in and we're working within those limits. So what I advertise here, I'm not trying to insult people. I said, and I'll say it one more time now, that I think a lot of the practical research that is done by people within the extended synthesis is great. I think there is a lot of great people in that movement. And remember, I, I was not calling out the bullshitters here. I was calling out the bullshit product. What is actually clogging the pipes of theoretical exchanges and disputes in evolutionary biology? That is the problem. I'm not putting the blame on specific people explicitly, at least, you know, uh, but we need to change the system. There, it's not, you know, the blame doesn't fall on a, a specific individual. This whole process, this whole debate about the extended synthesis just perfectly fits our time, okay? It fits the hyper-normality we live in. We've given up on actually understanding the complexity of the world that we live in, and we much rather have the illusion of doing something while we're not actually doing anything. And so my own master supervisor, Brian Goodwin, always used the slide with a dried out field of sunflowers to explain his picture of what was academia 20 years ago. It's become a lot drier since then. The pressure has mounted and we're all letting our heads hang down while the sun is shining up there. And this is what we should be doing. We should lift those heads again. We should fundamentally rethink and question ourselves. And we should call out and cut through the bullshit that is hindering our current uh, progress. So next module, I'm gonna give you a few impressions of how I think we should practically proceed in the short run. The lecture is called Beyond Networks, Not Against Networks. So a lot of it is gonna be based on sort of taking a very process-oriented uh, perspective on networks, on organisms, and on evolution. And then in the very last module, I will uh, talk a little bit more, spec in a bit more speculative way, how the very you know, way in which we do theory and in which we do science should change for this to become a possibility. As always, thanks for listening. And I hope to see you again next time. Goodbye now.